Hey everyone, my name is Caddy Wolf and welcome back to Homestuck and apparently there is a fifth wall in this universe or in this world. I don't even know what's going on with all these different worlds and stuff anymore. But there is a fifth wall and apparently what seems to be Aradia was violently smashing the hell out of that. I don't know what's going on with that, but you know, Doc Scratch was trying to you know, take care of business in his giant ass house while we were just busy going through his yearbook. <laughs> I'm calling it yearbook. Off. Oh, he turned the wall off. Or will I have to suspend your furniture privileges again? No, not my furniture privileges. <laughs> he turned the wall off. And we saw Hussy being weird with uh, two walls. Not sure what's going on there. Bonk. Ta finger. That scratch just is always getting into violent battles with other characters. I see. It's another one of your moods. We will have to work on ironing out this behavior before you meet your true master. What? Did you like kidnap her and make her do your evil biddings or some crap? He is a far less gracious host than I. Wait, what are you doing? She could have murder you or something. Although, since when did she use this? These kind of kinds of weapons. What was her weapon? I don't remember. No, stop that. You render yourself in a more symbolic manner at this instance. Yes, miniaturize yourself. Oh no. <laughs> what? I can't read that. Thank you. <laughs> he just wants that so he can be taller. She's still gonna stab your ass though. Ooh. She totally stabbed him. Right in the whatever that is. Oh, is this what we're doing now? Yeah, bet your sweet ass it is magics. That's magic, all right. Maybe I have not been shook enough with your breathing privileges either. Someone's an asshole. Someone's a jerk bag. Definitely feel like he's manipulating her by like, you know, forcing her to do his stuff or something. This vessel will reach your planet eventually. We can either go home the fast way or the slow way. Your express ticket can only be validated with a display of good manners, miss. <laughs> what? Battle again? Or battle over? <laughs> battle again. Stab his globe for his youth row. What is going on, guys? Also, this thing is just completely turned off now. So, was this what we were looking at this whole time up here on the banner? It was just the fifth wall? Weird. Actual suicide threat. Why? What is going on? Broom. I always knew Doc Scratch and Vanilla McShake was an asshole, but you know, this is just solidifying this theory even more. And there go the electricity privileges. I think now will be a good time for another round of re-education regarding her purpose. A little refresher on the prestigious employment opportunity for which she is being groomed. Did she ask for this opportunity? Oh, she turned it back on. Ooh, is it on? Here? <laughs> and since you are still my guest, it would please me to tell you this inspiring tale as well. Oh hey, it's Miss Paint. It is a tale to remind her of the sacrifice she must make, one serving to remind all of her people of the sacrifice once made by long-forgotten heroes in a discarded reality. It is of this sacrifice the sufferer died to speak the truth, and it is his tale I will tell you now. What are we talking about? Once in this very universe, you could say, Alternia was home to a peaceful race. Trollkind had never known the corrupting influence in their evolution, which led them to perpetual war and violence. That is to say, they had never known me. As was true of the bellicose world we know, there came to be 12 heroes on this peaceful planet. These heroes too had 12 ancestors whose fortunes were entwined with theirs. These 24 figures of legend were not of this world, but sent from the sky delivered from a reality not yet conceived. On the eve of their race extinction, the twelve heroes would begin playing a game. They would make an admirable effort, but they would fail. Their civilization had not prepared them for the rigors of this game, and the ultimate reward would fall shy of their grasp. But the failure was more comprehensive. 
more systematic than a result of simple inadequacy so common to young players of this game. Though they could not recognize it for the bad omen it was, this session was not the one in which they had been spawned. Such is the symptom of a subtle glitch affecting certain sessions, an error designed to trigger an unfathomable cascade of misfortune throughout Paradox Space. This glitch is the calling card of the one I serve. It is the discreet, gentlemanly manner in which he reserves his place in the universe for later visitation. Your glitch is Lord English? The heroes understanding their defeat was absolute sought advice from the mother of all monsters. She offered them a choice. The heroes could either accept their defeat along with the extinction of their race and put no others at risk, or she could show them a path to a second chance, to a reality in which the chosen heroes of their race would be strong enough to succeed with ease and claim the reward. This reset would come at the cost of wiping the failed heroes from existence. They would live new lives from scratch, playing different roles in the reset reality with no memory of the game they played or the choice they made. The heroes chose to accept this bargain and scratch their session. In doing so, they jump-started the reality in which the 24 figures of legend would together be created, and I as well, and then sent back in time to take our places in history. Though I was delivered well before history even began, before the dawning of life on their planet. This time around, I would oversee its development and thus fulfill the mother's promise of an aggressive, ruthlessly prepared group of heroes, one that would not rest until victory was secured. The young 24 would again be scattered in two groups, 12 modern contemporaries and 12 ancients, but in addition to losing their memories of everything that had happened before the scratch, there was another catch for the failed heroes. In the new reality, they would not serve as the heroes. They would mature to become the ancestor of the 12 they formerly regarded as theirs, and this 12 would be chosen for glory. These children would be the heroes to achieve victory and have the reward easily within reach. Wait, hold on, what? The 24 would be separated into two groups, and the 12 modern, 12 ancient, ancients, but they would lose their memories, and they would not be the main characters, you know, aka heroes, and then they would be, they would be the ancestors. What? So are you saying they are the ancestors of themselves? Seems bizarre. Uh, of course this promise was fulfilled to the letter, as you have seen. The entire bargain was executed without a single hitch, as those authorized by my master always are. There was however one minor anomaly. One of the failed heroes, in his new life as an ancient on this now brutal planet, began to remember. This is his story. This is the story of the signless. Ooh. How can there be a signless though? Also, this looks familiar. Whose sign is this? Few ever knew the sufferer's given name, presuming quite reasonably he had none, and he came to be called signless. Unlike his peers distributed elsewhere in history, he was not given a sign at a young age. Alas, there were no signs reserved for one of his mutant blood. So it's Carcat, right? Mutant blood? <laughs> His genetic deviation from the social order made him a pariah, forcing him to wander the world alone for many sweeps, concealing the color of his blood to avoid certain execution. But it may also have been due to his mutation that he began to have the visions, spontaneous lucid imagery of his world in peace before its fall. He would never see the complete picture or fully understand his previous incarnation's role in prompting this fall, or know of my hand in it. But the visions showed him all he needed to see. They held the promise of his people's true potential, beneath the ages of conditioned cruelty. They held the spark of revolution. In time, the visions gave purpose to his travels. He would preach heretical ideas no one else had dared to entertain, let alone risk discussing. He espoused the virtues of forgiveness, compassion, and equality among all bloodlines. He distributed his message intelligently, careful to preach only to those receptive, never attracting unwelcome attention but his growing movement could go unnoticed by the authorities for only so long. The Highbloods were livid over the unprecedented heresy, and soon, a massive sectarian war followed, spreading across the planet and throughout the galaxy. The conflict was lopsided, of course, with the Highbloods given full support from the Condens and her sea dwellers. Inevitably, the Silence would be captured, and when he was, it was not a matter of whether he would be put to the irons, but how hot they would be if he failed to recant. I think they're- well, what the hell was this? <laughs> I think they're talking about Karkat's ancestor, which is technically him? I don't know. 
During his penance, it was said the sufferer's compassion for his people underwent a divine transformation into limitless, burning rage. It burned hotter than the iron shackling him to the imperial flogging jut, and redder than the blood soaking his righteous leggings. When he was finally killed, his anger wrung through the cosmos with his last breath. That's why Carcass so angry all the time. This vast expletive was his final sermon, and somewhere encoded in its wavelengths was the truth in his teachings, waiting to reveal itself to any who would inherit his burden. Oh, whoa, you broke one of the wall. Boo, yeah. What? Out text? What is this? Nothing's happening here. This thing says booyah, but this this, this this doesn't say anything. It says booyah. I, I'm guessing that was the alt text, yeah? Yeah? <laughs> yeah, I'm guessing it was just booyah, but... Booyah, hussy broke some wall. His teachings would also persist through surviving disciples, but in hushed tones. His following would dwindle to an obscure cult facing persecution for centuries. After his execution, the body was burned, leaving only his irons. They cooled in the ash, as if his anger itself was subsiding, and his followers appropriated their shapes in defiance of the high bloods. The symbols became the sign of the signless, always shown as colorless as the cold iron, to conceal the stigma of his heel. This was as much a reminder to his followers to remain hidden as it was of the sufferer's sacrifice, and his rage hidden like heat in the iron, one day to be reignited by another of his bloodline. The sufferer preached that after he passed, another signless would come routing the end times for their planet. The second signless would continue his work and lead his people to glory beyond this realm. The followers kept his teachings alive for ages, even as the uproar surrounding the movement subsided. By modern times, the sufferer's scripture was little more than ancient superstition, all but forgotten. Hardly the anthema of old, but the followers had already made their preparations in the shadows, and when the second signless finally came, he would have a lucis to raise him and a sign to his name. So basically, the signless sign became the sign- No, really, hover your mouse over the banner like this. The fuck? Yeah, the fuck. Who- Okay, first of all, whose bed is this? Well, I mean, I guess it's- He's in Doc Scratcher's place now, because isn't that his room? The fuck? But what's with this wall? Is this the wall- th Actually, this is the exact room that Doc Scratch and the radio were, you know, having their battle. And then he turned it off, but then she turned it back on, and now Hussey has broken through. But also, it looks really pixelated. What, what's with this weird, you know, style? Oh, a little baby, a little baby. The sufferer required a less conventional upbringing to reach maturity. As a young grub, he landed in the brooding caverns where he would be expected to face his trials. But due to his mutation, surely no Lucis would select him. No creature sympathetic to his scent had been bred yet. His odds for survival would have been remote if not for a chance encounter. The Dolorosa belonged to the rare, rare class assigned strictly to serving the mother grub in the caverns, forbidden from visiting the surface. While on an errand, she found the young sufferer in his crater and immediately recognized the child as special, as well as in great danger. For an adult troll to raise a child was unthinkable, but she saw no other hope for him. The Dolorosa abandoned her duties in the caverns and fled to the surface to raise him. In time, she would become the first follower of his teachings and the first of his inner circle, but not his closest. So, I'm not actually sure if this is Carcat, because it's just it's just saying it's one of the sufferer's descendants, but it doesn't have to mean like, you know, the current shows are the direct descendants. It could be many generations, and I'm guessing this is Kanaya's ancestor. <laughs> hey, it's the old gang! They're back again. I don't know what's happening up here. So, Kanaya's ancestor, right? And then this looks kind of like Friska's ancestor. Well, actually, is it? I, I'm just, I just feel like this looks kind of like her. Uh, this is the robot guy's ancestor, I think, and this is Solix's ancestor. His is very obvious. He looks like a Power Ranger. <laughs> Surrounding him on his rise to infamy and throughout the rebellion were the most trusted elites among his devoted. The Villian... Wait, what was this weird symbol? The Villian Ick? Villian Nick? was a mage of the unequal telekinetic ability who, upon hearing the words of the sufferer, was inspired to free himself from the sort of slavery typical of his mentally gifted class. But his most devoted of all was his disciple. She listened to every vision he retold, every lesson he preached, and faithfully recorded his scripture. Her air was open to him always, and in time, his heart opened to her. To spread his message throughout the world, they took to the seas in the vessel of legend known as the first ship. 
It was said their love went beyond the four quadrants, transcending the grid entirely. Whatever that nonsense actually means. Yeah, I don't know if that actually means either f the fifth quadrant, which doesn't exist. What, another one? He's keeping little girls locked up in weird rooms and rambling about troll ancestors. I just know it. Wait, was there a thing in the, other, in the previous one? Oh, hell no. He's talking about ancestors, isn't he? Yes, he is. He's taking little girl out. He is. He actually is. Yeah, he does have little girls locked up in weird rooms. You're absolutely right. You gotta stop him. This looks like a like a arrow thing that, you know, the Doc Scratch has. The disciple was to be killed along with him, but at the last moment, the executor inexplicably took pity at her and allowed her to escape. She absconded with the leggings, which remained the only physical evidence of his holy suffering. She hid in caves for many sweeps transcribing all of his scripture from memory on the walls in the blood of slain creatures, and lived the rest of her days in monas monastic savagery- Wait, that's Napeta's ancestor then, because of the whole cave thing. Her dedication would be critical to the persistence of his message. But the Dolorosa was less fortunate, and was sold into slavery. She spent the rest of her life as a property of vicious sea dwellers. As for the Willianic, he was enlisted in a far worse, if more prestigious service. So the disciple, I'm guessing it's this, is actually Napeta's ancestor, and they're actually leggings, that's weird. All thirst blowed, not in my fucking comic! <laughs> Stop him! Stop, what the hell, oh my god. Damn! He was forced to serve as the helmsman for her condescension's imperial battleship. Psychics of his kind were exploited for interstellar travel, and his abilities made her ship the fastest in the fleet by far. She grew so enamored of her helmsman and his power, she would use her touch to extend his lifespan to match her own. Weird. Is he literally in the match right now? Oh damn, this place is bigger than I thought. Any idea which way he went? Come on guys, help me out. I help you out, but I don't know where he is. Is he gonna kick his ass? <laughs> Together, they explored the stars for thousands of years. Due to the speed of her ship, she would personally expand the boundaries of her empire typically being the first to greet new races before conquering them. I bet he's behind this door. You hear me scratch? The jig is up. <laughs> Why is he even coming after him? What jig, man? Let me in on this mystery mission. After making first contact, occasions which she generally kept cordial, she would move on to new territory while a diversion of her fleet set a course for the unfortunate civilization and proceeded to tear it apart. It could be any of the lethal brigades under her command to receive the orders, be it, be it the Dreshecutioners, Caval Reapers, Laugh Assassins, or Rough Annihilators, each was notoriously cruel in his own way, and each carried out orders with absolute loyalty, because while the Condens would extend, could extend a single life on her whim, she could just as casually cut short that of millions. Aha! Caught red-handed, you bastard! You stop clogging up my story with your troll fanfiction, this is the... <laughs> Troll fanfiction. I mean, is it troll fanfiction? Are you saying that this is not true? This is not actually what happened? It's all his fanfic? If anger, she could simply express her grievance through communion with her ancient Lucis of the Deep and turn its psychic devastation on her multitudes. The class hierarchy played into her hands politically in this respect. Killing off a haphazard swipe of the population or an entire class was suitable as a measure of last resort. But mass extermination does not lend itself well to practical governance. Its looming threat, however, is quite effective, especially while her empire was partitioned neatly into blood castes. She could use her leverage to delegate oppression to the subjugulators, whose unique abilities and exceptional brutality made them natural enforcers. They too would delegate in their governance, exploiting the pride and loyalty of dangerous highbloods beneath them. And so on down the Hemo spectrum, until the enslavement of the common castes was inescapable. In spite of their genetic gifts and strength in numbers, as a self-governing body, the land-dwelling portion of her empire was formidable. But the force of sea dwellers was equally formidable, and the two were kept in check, not only with the threat of psychic annihilation, but their mutual hatred and distrust. The only threat to her power was unification through uprising, a possibility made remote once she fully decentralized the race from the home world. She scattered all but the children throughout the galaxy after the most recent rebellion left led by the summoner. Upon doing so, she became so comfortable with her grip on power, she risked venturing deeper into space than ever before to grow her empire. 
Her fairy's ancestor is so bloodthirsty. But the more space she put between herself and the glob glob, the globe glob, the more she risked weakening her bond with the monster, the bond she and her successor shared with it exclusively could sway and become strengthened with the younger. Perhaps she grew complacent with the threat successors posed after such a long history of killing them with ease. Heiresses, upon reaching maturity, were expected to challenge the contents for the throne. It was not merely expected of them by their people, but demanded by the share looses. I like to think of her as the pet I gave to their race, as the, at the dawning of their species evolution, like the sentient warming gift. Again, it's just the sort of thing a good host does. That was not the right door. <laughs> uh, it was not indeed. There are a lot of doors though, man. If the lapse of her custo in her custodian bond was significant enough, it was not just political power she risked. At such a distance, she sacrificed concentration needed to curb its most dreadful psychic shriek of all, the galaxy-wide extinction event called the Vast Glow. Of course, this eventuality proved a fitting reward for such reckless expansion of her territory. She chose the worst time possible to explore further from the home world than she ever been. She was scouring the edge of the galaxy for systems to plunder when she received word of her planet's devastation by meteors. The young were being slaughtered, the mother grub was dead, the end times were upon her people. She ordered all fleets to return to Alternia, but such was her empire's expansion and interplanetary occupation. Few could make it in time to provide any meaningful defense. She instructed her helmsman to pilot the ship faster than he ever had, and he did so through extreme physical durst. He was able to leap across thousands of light years in a matter of hours. The exertion likely would have killed him if the glove didn't get to him first. Her touch could extend life, but never restore it to her lament. In that instant, her empire was gone. Glub Globe Swan Song wiped out her entire race, saved the Condens and her lone heirs, leaving the empire nothing more than a galactic ne necropolis of floating tombs. This looks like the right- is it, isn't this his room actually? Here's his printer. This looks like the right place. The hallway is all round and shit, just like his big stupid head, you're damn right. He's telling a story like with his face. She was forced to continue the journey home on auxiliary power. Her ship now travels near the speed of light, a pale shadow of its former velocity. It would take her another 612 solar sweeps after the glove to reach her destination. Are you saying that she is still coming back? She should arrive any minute now. Ooh. When she does, she will find nothing but ruins and dust. If she cared to look closer, she will find a city of slain exiles, a man on the moon, and a pair of black lovers locked in a deadly dance. But whether she looks or not, one thing will find her with certainty. A new employment opportunity. Say what? So her ancestor is still coming back. My beautiful panels, what has he done? That son of a bitch. It's going to take so many sweeps to clean this mess up. So very, very many sweeps. I thought he was cleaning up. Everything is still on the floor. What's going on, dude? Clearly he was too busy telling his story. Are you paying attention, protege? Wait, this is your protege? Wow. This is where your role in the story begins. Now stop your pouting and listen, unless you want another helping to the backside of mine. Oh, nuts. I seem to have forgotten my discipline broom. Goodness gracious, why'd you kidnap her and force her to become your protege? God damn it, he's got a bowl full of these things? He's pulling his snooty horseshit candy bowl stunts to mock my little arrows now. Excellent host, my ass. He's totally taking control of your story. Anyway, the last of the 12 ancestors arrived a bit late. In fact, she would cross through her portal six centuries after the descendants have, had come and gone. There weren't many left to look after her, so she ended up in foster care. What? Who are you talking about? I remember it like it was yesterday. And for one who has much time on his hands as I, it essentially was. <laughs> flip. Flip the table. Meteor. Why is there suddenly a meteor here? Is that a radio? <laughs> I would raise the girl to be groomed for her calling. My lessons would emphasize obedience, mastery of the clockwork magics, and being locked in a room. Oh my god. As you must have gathered by now, my employer will enter this universe quite soon. I would then relinquish my custody to him, and she will serve at his, as his handmaid for an attorney to be specified. As you must have also gathered, she has already done so. Though her most common of blood should have let her expire in just a dozen or two sweeps, his curse 
kept her very much alive, and she did not intend to stay that way. I am so very confused right now. What is going on? Why are you eating this crap? Oh my god, how could these possibly be so delicious? So... Aradia has been captured, or... I don't know, man. There's so many versions of her, I'm just very confused. His curse is one of conditional mortality, with the desired outcome contingent on her service. When I release her, she will take her place as his, at his side and travel through time to carry out his orders. Well, I guess that explains why there's a gazillion versions of her. While I am his weapon of subtlety and precision, the handmaid- Hey, she is the handmaid of time. Oh my god, is that where it comes from? The handmaid is strictly an uh, apparatus of terror and suffering. We have both paved the road to his arrival. I, in my way, and she in hers, she would be present during every watershed moment in her civilization's development. Her reoccurrence in history would earn her the reputation of a demoness, more feared than even her master. A man, though dreadful, rarely makes himself seen. She stirred up class warfare and intensified bigotry in whatever era she haunted. She made sure the descendants would enter a world which prepared them well for the game and took measures to see that they would play as they did. But once they entered and their world was in ashes, her work was nearly complete. Now, six centuries later, she would be given one last order to follow before her curse was lifted. A simple recruitment job. I still don't understand what's going on. Whoa, better go easy on these, might need some later. <laughs> Everyone just always steals Doc Scratch's candy. The handmaid will enlist the condens, ex extending the same bargain once offered to her. It will be the sort involving neither negotiation nor possibility of refusal, expressed in terms plainly understood by the psychotic genocidal. The condens will serve as her new master's witch, carrying out his work in the places he cannot reach. So what, her whole job is just to recruit the sneak? There you are, go ahead, keep talking, Cuba. I got you in the crosshairs of my broom bristles. I have got you, you pompous motherfucker. The two last trolls alive, blood of rust and royalty, will make each other pay for the crimes against their race. Their payment will be mutually dealt in the currency of punishment and reward at once. The condens will be rewarded with the power and immortality her new service entails and punished by the grueling slavery for which it is synonymous, and you, young lady, are to be punished by death at the hands of your replacement. And so too will this be your reward. What the hell? Who would agree to that kind of crap? <laughs> blah blah blah, F you. Tick tock, tick tock, tick tock. My heartbeat falls in rhythm with the clock as I draw close to my prey. I leave nothing to chance, for you see, it is the most dangerous prey of all. A four foot tall asshole is suspenders who won't shut up. Wait for it, hussy. Wait for it. You're only four foot, man. Short. <laughs> and so, my dear, that is the inspiring tale of your people, and why you should feel rather privileged to be in the position for which I have groomed you meticulously. I think she hates your guts. Are you not grateful? Yes, surely you are, and it warms the soft, fluffy material in my chest to know this. What is it? What are you looking at over there? Ah, oh, of course. The clock. I can see you have a good eye for a fine timepiece. Your exemplary taste is certainly owed to a quality upbringing. Perhaps you wish to know the history of the clock and how I came to possess it. Yes, I can see the sparkle of curiosity in your eye. It's a marvelous tale, one almost as long as it is verbosely told. Where do I even begin? <laughs> Rah, trip. No, dude, you ruined it. The holy hell is this? What does it say? Bong or something? Story time's over, windbag. Whoops, oh shit, get this fucking clock out of my way. I am a one-man stampede and I've got a broom and that peel of splintering wood you hear is the last gasp of a priceless antique disintegrating beneath the outrageous fury of my authorial hooves. Jesus Christ. Bet, 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 bet. <laughs> He's totally caught him unaware. If I have to put up with one more smug, meandering interlude in my own story, I'm gonna crack your head open and serve you a heaping bowl full of your downy soft puppet ass. How do you like that for hospitality, Doc? I believe you will find that as hosts go. I am simply the best there is. Say what? <laughs> Everyone is- everybody is totally fed up with your condescending, self-indulgent narrative style. They all want to go back to my slightly less condescending, slightly more self-indulgent style. Yeah, I can- I can see that. Meanwhile, uh, Aradia is just- I guess, is just leaving. 
See, even that little girl has had enough of your shit. Run, Aradia's ancestor. Wait, Aradia's ancestor? Oh, okay. Run, you have locked up your last Asian schoolgirl, you suck fuck. What? Oh, don't you flop around at me like that. Are you listening, little man? Literally, what? Oh, whoa, what the hell is this? <laughs> the giant Altex. How'd you do that, man? Girl! Spike. Suckers! Wait, so this is not Radia. This was her ancestor? Huh? But she's still the handmaid of time, I guess? I don't know. Boo, yeah. Hmm. What is going- Whoa. You there, girl. Oh, jeez. Wait. He's literally a puppet? I, I mean, I guess he he has been a puppet this whole time, but I didn't know he was literally made of puppet material. That's very weird. I guess... I guess he is just a limp, a lifeless puppet when I am around. Like a reverse Calvin and Hobbes kind of thing. That is... That is a little disturbing. It is more than just a little disturbing. Girl, quit all this scurrying around. These words look familiar. Someone has said them before, how's this? Oh well, might as well try to get that disc back. I wonder if I can just... Just sort of reach up into... And... All this is very familiar, but I don't remember who said this. Do you believe you can escape the... Or escape me before I arrive? Is this Lord English talking? Weird, this is like a very green Aradia bot. Or something. How do you expect to outrun me? Okay, I think it's Lord English coming, oh no. What the hell? Looks like he's had the disc repaired for a while already, but didn't tell us. Motherfucker just loves the sound of his own voice. He sure does. Oh my god, how's this? When I am already here. Oh god. Snop. What is going on here? Snop, fuck. Ollie's Audi. Snop. Oh jeez. What is this? Fuck. No, you dumb homo too. You're, you're snaping wrong. Unsnop. Unstop. Oh my god, what's going on? Well, alright guys, I'm gonna leave this here before we insert this too. Seems like uh, time-traveling demon Lord English is about to come into our world. He, I, I don't even know how it's going on. So, Cassie he broke the fifth wall and then came into whatever this world is and then smacked the living crap out of Doc Scratch who kind of turned into a real-life puppet? Which is really weird. D does that mean he officially died? Because I think there, you know, the whole thing was that he was gonna die in order for his master to come. And apparently he's been, like, keeping Aradia's ancestor locked up and training and grooming her. It's just, it's just all really weird and god, he is so creepy. <laughs> but in any case, I'm gonna leave this video here before we uh, get on to, I guess, this too. I thought this whole thing was this too, but I guess we're gonna move on to this too. And then probably start X6 real soon. So look forward to that, guys. But in any case, thank you so much for watching this. Let me know what you think about how creepy Doc Scratch is. And I will see you guys in the next video.